Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Nick Lugo Show, where I study the tactics, practices, and principles of some of my favorite achievers. Today, I bring on to you an incredible guest who has, well, done it all. He's achieved so much success as a writer, director, stand-up comedian, famous hypnotist, and YouTube sensation. His, his YouTube videos on sleep and insomnia have garnered over 20 million views, and he's been able to change millions of lives, curing them of their insomnia, helping them with anxiety, fear, dreaming, lucid dreaming, affirmations, inspiration, and many others. This man knows so much about how how you can, well, fix your sleep and really improve your quality of life with the power of hypnosis. If you haven't checked out hypnosis yet, I really, really suggest, suggest you, give, you give it a try, and I really, really suggest you check out John Moyer's YouTube, which is going to be put in the description below. Make sure to check out my sponsors for this video, and make sure to subscribe to, well, this YouTube channel, or do me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. I hope you enjoy this episode with John Moyer. The huge thing is people who go to sleep feel a tremendous amount of anxiety before they sleep. And that is one of the reasons why we have ins- insomnia. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things that I did last night when, yes, I was struggling with this, this feeling of anxiety, I did write, okay, maybe I'm not exactly where I want to be, but what did I do? That was really great. Like, how have I really improved throughout yeah. that? Yeah. And, um, and yeah, that was really helpful. Yeah. And, you know, the the thing that I've especially learned when it comes to like goal setting or or, or things like that is, is you just, you kind of have to focus on what you prefer. I don't use the word want. I prefer this. And then your mind starts to operate from a perspective of you are somebody with these characteristics and these characteristics prefer certain things. When we use like the word want, our mind keeps us in a state of want. I want something because I don't have it. And your mind keeps saying, well, you don't have it. So just keep wanting it. Mm. Um, You know, the other thing is, is too, is you, you just, you got to let go of thinking about the time frame or thinking about how something is supposed to show up. It's just knowing that, everything, you know, will align if we let go of that, you know, the structure of keeping ourselves in a box. And then we can be surprised about all the things that, you know, actually can show up to deliver what, you know, what we prefer. So it was a lot of trial and error for me, but you know, it, it seems to work. Well, let me ask you. So do you ever experience that before you go to sleep or did you experience this throughout your life where you go to sleep and, you know, there's just some thoughts that are ruminating in your head and you struggle to fall asleep? You you just, you know, you're thinking about all the stuff that you've got to do or what's not working and, you know, and and a huge thing for, for what we experience in today's day and age is people are climbing into bed and they're spending 15 or 20 minutes on their phone. Yeah, looking at, you know, and they're, you know, social media and then they're seeing all the negative stuff or all this, you know, the news or the drama. And that's that stuff's going right into our mind. Right. You know, right before we we go to sleep. But, you know, I mean, I've I've been there where you get into bed and you're just like, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to make this this happen? And but that is something that, you know, again, with a little practice, we can rewire our brains to, you know, stop focusing on. So I do have some thoughts on this and I want to see what you think about it. Um, One book that I read, which was really, really great. It was Cal Newport's uh, Digital Minimalism. And the idea behind it was that it's better, you know, there's a lot of problems that come with the technologies that we have. And one of the ideas that he brought up was that we Americans, we technology users are, have become uncomfortable with silence and boredom. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, and you go to, let's say the bathroom, right? You go to sit on the toilet, right? And what you're doing in that moment is you have nothing better to do than to think. Yeah. All all you're going to do is you're going to sit and think and just do the things that you're, and just ruminate about the day. Okay. You know what? Did I have a good day today? What is on my mind at the moment? If I have an anxiety, well, even if you're sitting there trying to read a magazine or something, if you have some anxiety that's propping up, then- you're going to, you're not going to be able to read. You're going to consider the anxiety. You're going to think about it. And I notice myself doing that all the time, but imagine if some technology comes along that is so, let's say stimulating like TikTok, like Facebook, like Instagram, these things that are designed to be stimulating comes up and well, now you have this moment of boredom, this moment where we used to have reflection on our anxiety and sort of, you know, confronting our anxieties as they come. Well, we can't 
deal with them, right? We just, we just push them off. We push them off. We push them off. And when do we end up pushing them off to sleep? Yeah. The only time when you're alone in your thoughts, if you're using these technologies throughout the day is sleep. And I think that's one of the causes of anxiety rising when social media comes around. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is, is too, is like, you know, one of the theories about when we dream it's, you know, it's our, it's our minds, you know, kind of clearing out, you know, either the clutter or it's our minds kind of, you know, focusing on the things that, you know, we're, we're, we're going on during, you know, during the day. So all this, there's so much clutter in there that we're dealing with and, you know, there's, and again, it just, it amplifies whatever stress or, you know, anxieties that we're going through. And, but, but, you know, you're exactly right. When you're, you're there, you're not using the time to reflect. You're using either the time to um, just kind of space out and not focus on what's important. And then you're looking at social media, which is going to amplify the, the, the stuff that you're worried about or thinking about, because that's what it is. You know, you see, you know, a negative tweet or this person did that person or this person's ranting and that person's so angry. So that, you know, you're focusing on that. And, um, you know, one of the things I try to do is, you know, if I'm standing in line someplace, instead of looking down at my phone on social media, there's a book that I'm, you know, that I'm reading that I'm trying to fill my mind with, you know, something constructive and something positive other than, you know, the minutia of negativity that's, uh, that, you know, that's out there. So I'll give, I'll give a little plug here because I think it's really, really important. And, I, and one of the reasons that why I brought you on here is because you give such great tools is that this man, John Moyer, has about 211,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel just on people that are focused on hypnosis for sleep. He gives them, he posts these eight hour videos of just allowing people to get better sleep and get some nice hypnosis for sleep with millions and millions of views. So tell me, why do you think these videos are so successful? One of the things that I found was the fact um, that yes, people are looking for ways, you know, ways to fall asleep. So, and and my channel kind of began by happenstance is, is kind of what I said to you earlier is that, um, you know, I was doing a stage hypnosis show and after the stage hypnosis show, we, there was always product to sell. There were CDs and, and, and that sort of thing. So programs for stop smoking and reducing stress and weight loss and, and sleep. Well, when CDs kind of went out, you know, they were out of the picture. Nobody had a CD drive anymore. A lot of hypnotists were putting stuff on thumb drives and then they were selling that. And I just said, instead of dealing with that, I'm going to put my content on YouTube and I'm just going to tell people at my show go and check me out on, on YouTube. And at that time, I wasn't really super, I wasn't really active at all on YouTube as a creator, just as, um, you know, as a viewer. And my initial thinking was, is that maybe somebody would see my content on YouTube and then maybe they go over to my website and get the, you know, the digital download of, mm -hmm. of the program. But what I didn't realize was that people actually use YouTube as that platform to get that, you know, that kind of content. And I had one particular program that took off, you know, to help people fall asleep. And as I was talking about earlier, subsets of subsets, that's kind of, you know, where my, my, my channel launched from was for sleep. Of course, um, I obviously have a lot more uh, things that I think are important to share with individuals than just falling asleep. So I, I frame the falling asleep and clearing negative energy or, you know, uh, downloading positive energy. So I take some type of you know, useful mindset that can help people during their day that can allow them to fall asleep and kind of, you know, rewire, rewire their minds. And that really is a good, people are looking to fall asleep. You're going to sleep anyway. Right. So, but here's a time that you can actually, you know, import something into your mind that that's going to be, um, it's going to be beneficial. And I think that's why for me, it, it's taken off the way that it has, because I, I found a, a, you know, a platform that allows people to fall asleep, but yet at the same time, not just experience sleep, but also experience um, some positive programming, if you will, for their mental and emotional states. So it's really, really cool, actually. So I used to do morning meditation and I still do it sometimes, you know, morning meditation is really great, but, um, but explain to people the difference and I'm more referring to the suggestions part of it, the difference between meditation and hypnosis and explain why they're similar, but also why hypnosis is almost better for implanting these, these positive messages into the subconscious mind. And, you know, that's, a, and that actually is a really good question because I started out, doing um, hypnosis, right? Hypnotizing other people, doing self-hypnosis on myself. And then it was about a year and a half ago, I decided that I was really going to commit to meditation 
you know, as well. And, you know, we hear those terms a lot. We hear guided meditation, we hear self-hypnosis, there's guided hypnosis or hypnosis meditation. And sometimes those words are, are all kind of, you know, interchange, interchangeable, but the, the thing that makes the two similar is the fact that you're going from beta brainwave state. That's your active conscious state throughout the day when you're you know doing everything that you do throughout the day. You're slowing your brainwaves down from a beta state down into an alpha and theta brainwave states. So alpha and theta is where hypnosis and meditation happen. So you're literally slowing down um, you know, your, your brain waves. Now, physically, your body's going to experience the same things. And there's a lot of tremendous physical benefits from having going down into those alpha and beta beta brain wave states relative to your body. You're going to release endorphins and dopamine, antioxidants, all these things are going to help your body to, you know, feel better. And the other thing that happens though, is when you're in that state relative to hypnosis, um, your mind is highly suggestible. So you're able to have access to that you know, the, the, the subconscious part of your programming where all your, 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 your wiring is right. All your computer programming, and you're able to then kind of make some new connections and, and switch some things around relative to hypnosis. So the, one of the analogies that I've, that I've used before, I, I don't know that it's completely accurate, but I've said that, you know, meditation is shutting the engine off, letting the engine cool down, giving the engine a break. Um, whereas hypnosis is you're turning the engine off, you're giving it an oil change, you know, mm. and it's up and you're fitting it with some, you know, some aftermarket parts for, you know, an upgrade. Yeah. So you can look at the two of those, um, you know, that way. And obviously with, um, you know, hypnosis, you might have somebody speaking to you. Um, you know, maybe there's affirmations or, or suggestions, you know, meditation can be something where, you know, there's not anyone speaking to you and maybe you're just listening to music or you're just sitting in, um, you know, sitting in, in silence or then there's meditations that, you know, they guide people, they call it guided meditation, which in a way is, is still a form of hypnosis. Yeah. I mean, I, I find both of the practices very, very similar, right? So I'm a certified professional hypnotherapist and I do hypnosis. Yeah. I do it all the time. You know, I, I never got to bring this up, but yeah, like I do it all the time. I was doing a hypnosis, a group hypnosis session yesterday. And it's really, really interesting because these two states are, you, you actually call them uh, brother states, sister states, or cousin states, yeah. you know, and they're really, really similar in the fact that, yes, they bring you into the state of wave state. They make you super calm and super relaxed and super focused at the same time. But one of the best things that I find about hypnosis is that I personally do hypnosis for productivity. So mm-hmm. hypnosis for productivity, focus, concentration. And I actually find meditation and hypnosis almost exactly the same if you're to do it in the in the hypnotherapy sense. But at the same time, what I do in my hypnosis sessions is I essentially bring them into a meditative state. And then all I do is I throw in those suggestions, those nice little, oh yeah. And you're going to be more productive and you're going to be more concentrated and your, your life is going to be better and all of these things. And it works. Yeah. It's beautiful. It works. It's that, you know, that's the thing that, I mean, when I started doing hypnosis, because I was a stand-up comedian for over, over 20 years and and I was always interested in the mind. And I remember when I, I 10, 11 years ago, uh, seeing a hypnosis show and thinking that's, I can, I can do that. And that would be something interesting to take me into a new direction because I was kind of burned out on comedy and, you know, the comedy scene wasn't the way that it was, you know, when I, when I, you know, why I began. So um, I never thought I could be hypnotized. And I just thought, and, and then it happened to me and I was just like, holy crap, this is, this is a real thing. And then not only experiencing um, just going through that, but then experiencing all the, you know, the benefits from that and how great I felt um, it, it literally can, you know, become addicting, right? Yep. Because it just, you know, it just, it feels so good and, and you don't want to be without it. So seeing what that, how that transformed me. And then of course, going out there and then hearing from other people, you know, hypnotizing people on stage and then then, then telling me what it was like after the fact, especially when I was performing on the cruise ships for Royal Caribbean, because, you know, you're going to be on the ship for a few days, maybe a week with the people from the show. You know, it's not like when you're on land, you do a show, you leave and you don't really interact with people. So people would come up to me, um, you know, and tell me, 
I can't believe how well I slept. Um, I can't believe how good I felt. Um, one woman, and one of the things that I did to um, invite people on the stage to make it appealing for, you know, for volunteers is I would let people know that if there's a goal that you're looking to achieve, as if there's some positive change that you want to make in your life, when you come up and participate tonight, we're going to enable that to be the case. And I had one woman say, well, I had no intention of going on stage. But yet when you said you were going to help me, you know, with a goal, she goes, that's what made me want to come up on stage. And she said, my whole thing is I'm a chocoholic. I eat way too much chocolate and it's out of control. So that was my goal to, to be able to not eat chocolate. And she said, it's been four days on the ship. She goes, there's chocolate everywhere. I haven't eaten chocolate this entire time. Mm -hmm. And my friends, you know, can't even believe, you know, uh, you know, what, a, what a difference it's made. So, and, and, you know, the thing about chocolate, I mean, that's a, that's a kind of a small glimpse, but, you know, I, I talk to people and hear from so many people, you know, the big things that are actually impeding people's ability in life to be able to move forward, just to be, you know, successful, just to be able to get through the day, hearing that feedback from people, you know, how hypnosis meditation has changed their life. That's, you know, that's what's so incredible. And there really is this huge um, movement in that direction. I, I did a, you know, I did a survey, I think a month ago or so, a couple of months ago on my, on my YouTube community. And I asked my subscribers, you know, how long have you been doing hypnosis or meditation? You know, was it, you know, less, you know, six months, less than a year, you know, more than three years, your entire life. And the majority of people it had only been within the last couple of years that mm. they were starting to, you know, to realize this. And I, and I think the power that we have within our minds is something ancient civilization, ancient humanity understood and was able to harness and use. And we, you know, somewhere in the middle ages, you know, the enlightenment period, you know, we, we fell out of that emotional state and we got more into that thinking state yep. And um, I believe now that that people are starting to there's there's a resurgence of of that there's an awakening of the mind for people. Yeah, actually, you know, every time I speak to a hypnotist, I've had multiple hypnotists on this podcast, and they always bring up their success stories because yeah. there are just so many. There's always yeah. a success story of yes, like I was able to change someone's life in such a positive way. They had no idea that it was coming, and it just happens. Like it just happens, and um, and it's really really powerful powerful experience. Like I've had m multiple of those in my life and it's just, it's really cool to hear those stories of, yeah, like my life has changed so much. And yeah, ex especially, you know, for me, because, you know, at, at one point, it I mean, it was just relegated to, you know, audience members and, you know, people that, you know, maybe had bought, in, you know, or bought my CD after a show for a program and somebody would email me and tell me how much it's, you know, but now I get to, I, I literally get to hear from people all over the world that, um, share their experiences. And, you know, it's like, if we can just spread that, you know, and, and reach those people, it's just a rippling effect. And I think it, it's just going to positively impact humanity. So I will say this one more time, make sure to listen to his hypnosis sessions before you go to sleep, because literally like, this is the stuff that you're going to get. Give me some stories. Give me, give me an email that you got. Give me something that someone told you about a YouTube video that they saw that, um, and that they listened to that changed their life. I've heard from people that one of my, one of my big, um, programs is, you know, overcoming heartbreak, um, getting mm -hmm. over your ex or, you know, uh, or a breakup. And, you know, that was born from, you know, experience that, you know, that I had had at some point. And then, you know, also, uh, you know, my wife had gone through um, a bad breakup before we were together. And we know what that despair feels like we, and, and, you know, as, as a hypnotist, your mind can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not under hypnosis. Yeah. One of the things that when you go through a breakup, you're, well, first of all, you're literally, your mind is programmed. Uh, it's a habit to be in this relationship. And then when it's gone, everything is upended. And then your mind tends to work, you know, to the nth degree relative to the, you know, to the negativity. And you're thinking life is over life. Yeah. You know, there's not going to be any, you know, any more hope and it's going to be this disaster. And, you know, I've heard from people that, that have shared with me that they, they were on the precipice of taking their own life. They were in such a dark place and being able to hear the information, you know, that I, that I shared with them 
And in that program, and of course, I always tell people it's your, it's the power of your mind. I'm just the, like the guide, your yeah. mind's making all the connections and your mind's, um, you know, doing all of that, making those changes for you. So hearing that from people that they were able to kind of be elevated out of this, you know, this, this darkness, this dark pit, and they're able to have a sense of, of hope again, and they're resuming, you know, a, a normal pattern within their daily lives, but, you know, void of, of having that person. So knowing that I can have, you know, take something that I went through and that I understand the pain of and be able to, you know, share that with, you know, with, with people. I mean, that, that's one of the big ones, because obviously you're talking about somebody being able to stick around, right. And they're not, yep. you know, they're not, uh, they're not checking out, but so, you know, yeah. So yeah. definitely tell me, like elaborate a little bit more, tell me how your life has changed. So you were a stand-up comedian for 20 years and then you yeah. moved to hypnosis. Yeah. How has your life changed? in general, ever since you sort of switched the mindset? Well, one of the things that led me in that direction, because, you know, I was, I graduated from film school, you know, I had some independent screenplays produced that I wrote and it was, you know, comedy screenplays. And, you know, that performance element of being on stage was something that I was, was always in, incredibly uh, passionate about. And that's what I was going to make my life. When I was a kid, um, you know, my father was a very talented musician, but he was always, he had a fear and a limiting belief that a real man doesn't go out and perform. He's not an entertainment you know, entertainer for a living. A real man works 40, 50 hours a week at a job he hates, which is what my, you know, my father did. He wound up working for his grandfather's company. My father was miserable mm -hmm. that he wasn't able to go out and pursue his dream. So I saw what my father's life was like, and I'm like, I'm not going to wind up like that. And when I was 13 years old, I, I said to my dad, I, I said, what do you think about me? taken the super eight millimeter movie camera. We didn't have VHS cameras back then or anything. It was super eight millimeters. So what do you think about me? I, I would really like to, you know, make movies and do something in the entertainment industry. My father said, I think that's another one of your stupid childish ideas. So he told me that I was like 12 years old, right? That stuck in my mind. So I'm like, I'm not going to wind up my, like my dad. And my dad just told me I couldn't do something. So screw you. I'm going to go out and, and, and do it. And that's what I set out to do. Graduating from film school and then, but going on the road and performing stand-up comedy. But the nature of comedy really changed in the early, early 2000s. And it really wasn't what it had been previously. And I never cared about being the richest or the most famous. I just wanted to be able to go out make a living doing what I love to do. But the, the, the challenge is, is, you know, I, I went through a divorce. I was a single dad um, with, with two kids. And, you know, when it comes to screenwriting, they say all drama is conflict, right? There's not going to be a Star Wars if there's no Darth Vader, if there's no Death Star, right? If there's yeah. the prince doesn't need to be rescued. So I took that mindset and applied it to my life with comedy, right? I thought all drama can be conflict, which is funny on stage. So I was able to make all these dark, dysfunctional jokes on stage that made people laugh, but they were all a reflection of my dark, dysfunctional life. So I wasn't happy, happen, happy personally. And you know, when you we were talking about, you know, earlier before we got on here, just that that moment of, you know, maybe waking up in the night and thinking, oh my gosh, I how's this going to turn out? How's this going to this hasn't, you know, yep. and what do you like 19, 20 years old? 20. Okay. So imagine waking up at, you know, in your early forties in the middle of the night going, I'm how, how is anything going to change or be any different for me right now? I'm pretty set in my ways. I pretty have, I have this way that I want to be able to maintain my life, but I have no idea how that's going to, you know, happen. You know, being single, you know, the relationships were all dysfunctional. And then that's when I, I was doing a, a, a comedy show for an event and for my portion, and there was multiple entertainment ven or entertainers happening, but for my portion, you know, the venue was maybe half full to hear me do comedy. And then after me, there was a stage hypnotist and I stuck around for that. And it was standing room only. And I'm like, I had half the audience. This guy has got all these people. And I'm like, there's something to that. And I, I think that's where I want to make the change. And I want to start, you know, start doing that. So what happened was, is I, I trained in hypnosis. I retired from stand-up comedy and I, but I was able to go back and take all the contacts from the comedy world, all the mm. you know, club owners and managers and agents and bookers and all that sort of thing. I said, Hey, guess what? I've got a whole new show. So I was really able to hit the ground, you know, running. But the cool thing was, as I wasn't doing like these hell gig 
cowboy bars in Montana, you know, anymore. I was doing high end corporate events and all, you know, I was doing, I was able to do universities and, and high schools and, you know, there was more money attached to the, you know, these, the, you know, these events. And I wasn't driving 12 hours to get, you know, to stay in a motel six, you know, right. in in, you know, Montana someplace, I was being flown first class, right. To go to do these events. And then consequently I was able to also get in, I was performing for Royal Caribbean cruise line. So it was like, like everything went from zero to 60, you know, for me and that, and that span of time when I started to, to do it. Wow. The, the, and the thing was, is not only was it changing my, you know, my professional experience, I was doing what I loved. I was still in the entertainment industry um, and I was helping people and I was making way more money than I'd ever made, you know, you know, doing stand up comedy. But the reflection of what was going on with me inside was what was so cool because I was, you know, seeing life differently. I was experiencing life differently. I had an entirely different perspective, you know, on me. And, you know, I wound up meeting, you know, the, the you know, the woman of, of my dreams. And, you know, we've been married just over five years now. We've been together, uh, I think, going on uh, nine years wow. um, now, you know, former Mrs. Utah, first runner up Mrs. America. Um, and I always say she's as brilliant as she is, is beautiful. So my relationships completely changed you know, the interactions that I were having, people fell out of my life, the drama, the negative people, they fell out of my life and, you know, more higher minded people, you know, showed up. So everything changed uh, across the spectrum. And that's one of the things that I tell people it's, you know, there's no out there, it's all in here. So what we have in here is what's reflected out, out there. Yeah. That's one of the things that I noticed in my personal life ever since I started doing hypnosis, pretty much three things, right? One is that I was a lot less negative, right? You know, all the negative thoughts, I really started to understand my mind and say, you know what, those negative thoughts don't really exist. They're just exactly, it's all in here. Second of all, and I think this was real. actually this, the second one's kind of, you know, related, but life became a lot more quiet, right? My, my mind quieted down and I, yeah, I really, I, I was able to, as one of my, um, one of my favorite people on the world, Brett Hill, he was also on the podcast. He says, move towards peace, move mm -hmm. towards peace. And there's really no need to do anything else because I didn't need that stimulation. I didn't need anything like that. I was able to quiet my mind. And the third one, which I thought was really cool is life became a little bit more flexible. Yeah. When I, and when I say flexible, I mean, the world seems more malleable. I could make changes. I could do things and I'm not locked into this rigid, strict yeah. structure and I could do pretty much whatever I want if I want to. Yeah. And, and that's because you start to, you know, you, you believe that in your mind, right? Whatever the, you know, the mind can believe, you know, you, you, you can achieve. And, and one of the examples that I, that I share with people is I was doing a hypnosis show at one point, and I had a woman on stage, she was a medical doctor. And the suggestion that I gave to her was that her belly button would be missing. And so I, you know, I woke this woman up, she comes out of hypnosis, and she's looking around. And I'm like, what are, you, what are you looking for, right? She's looking all over the stage for her belly button. And she tells me her belly button is missing, right? Everybody's laughing. But she says, Look, I'm a medical doctor. This is literally medically impossible. I cannot lose my belly button. But yet I have lost my belly button. So here it has this, you know, this woman that comes from this perspective of how science, you know, and biology and anatomy works, but yet she was, you know, that was almost completely just put on the back burner because she was, she was looking for her belly button. She really believed that that was the case. So she's saying all that while hypnotized, she's saying like, like I know, like that rational part of her is still there. While yeah, the yeah, she, it was interesting because there was this. She was having this kind of argument within her. She goes, "It's impossible. I know this is impossible. I am a doctor, but yet I, I can't find my belly button. It's gone." So, uh, wow. that to, and it was just it was so funny. But so you imagine, you know, when you when you you, you tell somebody and when their mind believes something. Um, there's a great one of the one of the most inspirational stories for me when I was uh, in college, Ray Bradbury came and spoke to us. And he's the author, for everybody who doesn't know, he's the author of Fahrenheit 451 and a bunch of other crazy, crazy books. Yeah. And this was I think it was a 19. It was like winter of 1988. And three or four years before he had written a, sh a short story called um, I think it was called the Twain B Experiment. And it was the story of a time traveler who built a time machine, traveled 100 years into the future. 
And he saw how everything was, and there was no war, there was no famine, there was no poverty, there was no infighting. Um, you know, everybody was thriving, everybody was healthy, everybody got along, there were peace. And he had traveled back to his present day and he told everybody, he said, this is what it's like 100 years into the future. And of course, over the next 100 years, all of that, you know, began to transpire. You know, there was no war, there was peace, um, medical advancements, no poverty. And of course, 100 years later, because of the advancement in medical technology, the time traveler was still alive. So they were having, they were going to have this big um, uh, event where they were all going to gather with the time traveler at the point where he streaked across the sky and mm. turned from the past into that, you know, that now present moment and, and, and greet him. So they're waiting for the exact moment, the exact moment happens and nothing happens. And then it's a few minutes later, nothing, a little while later, nothing. And then finally uh, the time traveler leans over to the person next to him and says, guess what? I lied. So, oh. and, and I re that impacted me so much. You know, I think I was 18 years old when I heard that, but it was just, the, it was the epitome of, we all collectively believe something and therefore it was made possible. And you look at the other side of that coin, if you collectively believe something that's in the negative, that's not right, you know, how is that going to um, in, impact us as well? And that's one of the challenges that, you know, I always say, you know, growing up in the 1980s, we always lived in fear of the Cold War, right? It was going to be nuclear missiles that were going to blow everybody up. Yeah. And so now I, I say the, the existential threat to humanity isn't necessarily from without. The existential threat to humanity is, is what's going on on the inside, how we feel inside of ourselves, how we're able to manage our own emotional states and how we're able to come to that inner peace. And once we come into that inner peace, then obviously that inner peace is going to re be reflected, you know, without to everybody. And we don't realize how much of an effect our subconscious mind has on that belief. You know, yeah. like the more I do hypnosis, the more I change people's, we'll say thought patterns and yeah, change their narratives on life. It really, really has an effect on the way that they act and the way that they think yeah. in the world. It's incredible. Yeah. Because the, the, the one thing that I say to people, how many times have you gone to a seminar, you've seen a movie, you've read a book, you've seen a, a meme with a quote, and you're like, yes, this makes so much sense. This is it. This is the answer. I'm going to start doing this. So maybe you start making goals and you make a plan and you do all this, you put all this stuff together so you can move forward. And then maybe like a few days later, maybe like a week later, all of a sudden you're back to doing the same things again. You know, that information is just kind of worn off. And it's because what happens is, is the conscious mind goes, yes, this makes sense. This is right. We should do this. And the conscious mind goes, yes, of course it makes sense. Or the subconscious mind says, of course it makes sense for other people, but not for us because we can't do anything right. We can't, you know, everything we try fails and it never works out for us. So that, you know, that's really the important because that's where all this, you know, that's where all our programming is in, you know, in, in the subconscious mind. I, I you know, the, the, the phrase that I've heard is, you know, the conscious mind is processing like seven to 10 bits of information per second. If you look at it in computer terms and the subconscious mind, it's, it's like, you know, 20 million bits of information. Yep, yep, per second. Right. So we've got so much more happening on a subconscious level that we're not even aware of. And that's ultimately what's, you know, dictating our, our, our patterns of behavior. So, and, you know, Joe Dispenza says, you know, we're living today in the past residual outcome of our thoughts from yesterday, emotions from yesterday, our experiences from yesterday. So we just continue to expect things to be the exact same way. But if we want to break that pattern, then we have to rewire all of that programming in, in you know, our subconscious mind. And I tell people the easiest, hardest thing you will ever do is, you know, rewire your mind. I tell people it's hard because they can't believe it's so easy. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's, that's the key to it. And if you just make a little bit of effort, put that forth, you know, and then it's just, it compounds and it compounds and compounds. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing a complete change. I'm seeing a complete difference. So I did want to take a little left turn here, but still yeah. keep on the path and make a nice little transition. We don't realize also how much of an impact our subconscious mind, these things that we're speaking of are determined by our sleep. So I don't know if you ever read the book by, um, by Matthew Walker called, uh, what is it? How we sleep, why we sleep, why we sleep. Right. And, um, and he talked about just the impact of dreams 
and um and suggestions before sleep and at the same time just the impact of sleep itself on our subconscious mind and our actions so there was this beautiful incredible study of um of people who experienced things throughout the day and what they did was they kept track of their brain we'll say activation. So for example, let's say I go to pick up this cup. When I see the cup, I get an activation in the part of my brain that recognizes this cup. Then they tracked, okay, during their sleep, during their dreaming states, do they actually replay the things that happened throughout the day? And, and they track that by, do they have the same brain activation as they saw when they had this cup? And the answer was for about 30 to 40%. Yes. 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 Like when they're actually sleeping, they're replaying their emotions, their experiences throughout the day. And that's why you have advice such as never get into an argument and leave it on bad terms before you go to sleep. Or something like, um, I think it was Thomas Edison who said, whenever I go to sleep, I always leave a positive suggestion for the mind. Yeah. And yeah, go for it. Well, one of the things too is, you know, before when, when you go into a deep sleep, you know, you're, pa- you're going from that beta brainwave state down to that alpha and that theta brainwave state. So you're passing through yep. essentially that hypnotic state before you get down into that delta brainwave state. So you're going to be in this hip- hypnotic state, you know, r- regardless. So of course, you know, what you might be thinking about, what you might be focusing on before you fall asleep is going to be kicking around in there in that hypnotic state, which can amplify things and, you know, Ooh, make things I, more. I think I hit something actually, actually just the, the fact that, okay, you know what you say? Yes. We go into this hypnotic state, our conscious mind, as we're going to sleep is sort of deteriorating and our subconscious mind sort of takes its, takes its shape, shape, takes its form. And maybe that's why so many people experience anxiety before they go to sleep because yeah. they, because they have this conscious mind that's suppressing the anxiety. No, no, no. Let's just get through the day. Let's just do this stuff. But by the time you get to sleep, when you're in that state with just your subconscious mind, people feel that strong anxiety and they can't go to sleep. Yeah. There, I mean, there's a lot of, a, a lot of that is contributing to that. And, you know, it's like I said, people are, people are looking at their phones and, you know, they're getting content fed yeah. to them that, you know, that, you know, the, the, the powers that be think we're interested in, you know, some negative thing, this awful thing is happening. This awful, you know, thing is happening. And, and one of the things that I, I, you know, I mean, there's a, um, quite a lot of studies about, you know, just the influence of the phone screen, right. The light or, or just having that right there before you go to sleep and, yep. you know, the content is a whole other different, you know, situation. But if you feel the need to sit in bed and unwind as it were, you know, you can read or pull up a, you know, read something um, of, of that will actually have a more positive um, effect, you know, as far as some of the, the content and the, and the material that, you know, that you're getting. One of the things that there's a great app called Flipboard. Um, when you, you know, like when you flip through it, it's like you're flipping pages, but you can, you know, curate all of the subject matter that you're, that you're interested in. So, you know, my topics are, you know, uh, meditation and hypnosis and entrepreneurship and, all, you know, all of the positive things. So if I feel like I want to flip through something rather than social media, at least I can go to some place where I know that I'm getting information that's going to help feed me in a positive way before I put the phone down and, you know, fall asleep. Or for God's sakes, listen to John Moyer's damn hypnosis tapes. <laughs> Listen to them. I mean, like, that's the thing. I have so many friends that use hypnosis before they go to sleep, meditation and all these things. And man, like people are coming back. Like, it's really great to see that you have millions of people listening to videos. And and that's what's really, especially for me with, you know, with the YouTube content, because now we're talking about content outside of, you know, subject matter. But um, with me, you know, a lot of people on YouTube, you know, they'll put something out there. It's kind of a one-off, right? People watch the video and then, oh, I got, I laughed at that or I got, you know, I heard the news or whatever. But what I love about what I do is that, you know, it's content that, that never becomes antiquated. People keep coming back. And I hear this from people that, you know, man, every night I put, you know, your, your videos on, this is what I'm, this is what I'm listening to. This is what's playing for me. So people, you know, go back over and over again. And that's quite obviously quite gratifying and, you know, in in a, in a very positive, positive way. And it's so special. Like when you look at hypnosis, first of all, the only reason why, and I'm going to say this to, to my listeners, because I think 
people sometimes are so dumb is the reason why we don't do things is because of fear. If you listen to hypnosis and you're thinking about hip- doing hypnosis and the only reason why is because you're worried about some voodoo, blah, yeah. blah, whatever, pick on a video that has millions and millions of downloads, millions and millions of views. And listen to that one because you know, there's no voodoo, you know, there's no blah, blah, you know, there's no crazy mind hypnosis and you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Just listen, just take a second to listen and really, really get into it. I just listened to John Moyer's um, hypnosis tapes before I got on this podcast. And if you can't tell, I am on a cloud right now. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, and and it's funny because, you know, doing hypnotis, uh, hypnosis, the things that people, you know, are apprehensive about, right? They, you know, they think they're turning over control or they think all this, what happens if I get stuck in hypnosis? All of these things that, you know, you uh, explain to people, you know, aren't going to happen, but it's like, like you said, you bring up fear, you know, it's that, that, um, you know, that old saying fear is false evidence appearing real, right. We come up with all this stuff, but you know, that's the thing, at least with like, you know, you're listening to something on YouTube and I encourage people, I, I say, look, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. There's only what works for you. So explore, look around and, 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 find those things that, you know, maybe you feel comfortable with somebody's voice, you feel comfortable with the content and like, you can listen to it, you know, and you, you know, you don't have to necessarily try to enter into that hypnotic state. Of course, I would recommend you're just, we're someplace where, you know, people always laugh at my programs because in the beginning it says, don't operate a machinery or you know, <laughs> drive a vehicle, you know, and they, I get teased about that, but it's like, you have to put that in there for a reason. You have to put that in you there. Know, yeah. So, somebody that, um, that does. And, and of course, one of the things that I've started doing recently, um, that I haven't really done before is, um, I, I began to add the, the subtitles or the captions, um, to my videos because people, that way people can not just listen to something. If they want to read what's going on, they can be conscious and they can read the content. Cause I've had a lot of people say, do you have a script available or transcripts? Can I see this? So, um, I have been starting to, to, to put the captions on there. So people, you know, not hypnotized, but conscious can read along. Yeah. Yeah. Because one of the things that I recommend for my people who are, you know, who are hesitant about hypnosis is just to sit in and watch. You don't have to, you could just sit there and watch me do it and go through the process because I get it. It's definitely, you know, it's, it's definitely new and anything new requires, you know, a, a, something like a leap of faith, but that's why you go with, that's why you take the steps. That's why you listen to one of John Moyer at johnmoyer.com or John <laughs> Moyer on YouTube and you find the videos that have a lot of views and it just, it, it works. It works. One thing I do suggest is, um, and this is just an idea that's been popping in my mind for a while. I don't really feel the need to put in the work for it, nor do I feel I'm experienced enough to do it, but I really want to see this platform online. Um, Headspace, you know what Headspace is, correct? So Headspace is a meditation app where yes, it works for sleep. It works for anxiety. And they have these different um, you know, anxiety, calm, productivity, prioritization, all of these amazing things. But the reality is meditation is not meant for those things. Meditation is meant to be purposeless. You just sit there and you meditate and you just calm the mind completely. Hypnosis is meant to be purposeful. It's yeah. meant to be, okay, you know what? We're going to throw in some suggestions. And even though you're completely immersed in this present moment, and it's very similar to, to meditation, at the same time, it is different in that it influences your, influences your subconscious mind, gives you suggestions, and makes you, it has the power to make you more productive and all of these things. Right. Please, please, you have the power to do this. You are more <laughs> experienced than I do. Make a hypnosis headspace. Make something like that because I think people would absolutely go crazy for it just because there's, there's, there's such a market for it and it actually works better than meditation. Yeah. It, well, and you know, to, to your point, and that's one of the things I've thought about too, because I'm so used to, well, I said, you know, when I started to do meditation 18 months ago, I began to condition my body so that I could literally sit in the lotus position. Right. Yeah. And, and it, that at one point to me looked like the most uncomfortable thing to experience in the entire world. And I little literally had to stretch and it, it, it took my, um, you know, it took my body months to be able to, you know, to be able to comfortably be in, you know, that yeah. for people who don't know what the Lotus position is, it's where you take your legs and you put them on your hips and that it's like the strong, really, really flexible meditation pose, which yeah, I haven't sitting, figured out yet. You're sitting cross-legged, you you know, your spine straight, your, your hands are resting uh, on your lap. 
And there, but there was always something to me that's like, man, I feel like I should be inputting something here. Cause like, you, you know, the way you said purposeless versus purposeful. So one of the things that I started to do before I do a meditation, because I know I don't want to have my mind wander to think about, you know, a goal that I'm trying to accomplish or imagine, you know, energy coming down and, and, you know, empowering me. But so one of the things that I do when I, uh, I view my meditation, I go into the experience knowing that I'm clearing my mind and clearing my body, clearing my space to be able to receive those things, you know, that are, are the goals that I have. I'm not thinking about the goals. I'm not trying to get some aha idea. I'm yep. simply clearing everything out to come from that space of, of nothingness where I feel like I can prepare my body to receive when I'm, you know, when I'm, when I'm not meditating. Um, but you, you know, you do bring up a good point because when you're talking about headspace and it's kind of interesting because, you know, collectively, I think um, people want to frame things around more traditional mindsets of, you know, achieving your goals or relaxing or reducing stress and not necessarily, you know, around, you know, the, the, the ethereal concepts of, you know, going out and, you know, downloading energy from the universe to, you know, uh, achieve the things that you're, per, you're, you're preferring to, uh, you know, achieve. Cause I think there's some, there's some woo woo hesitancy, right. You know, yeah, about, yeah. you know, people thinking, you know, along in that, and that mindset, but it's, it's weird. There's so much potential for hypnosis. I don't, I don't know what to think about it yet because I haven't delve deeper into those realms but i had someone on my podcast uh christine osepian who does uh who does past life regression and when i mean past life regression i mean going into your past lives and i still don't know what to think about that and you know it's blown people's minds it's changed people's lives and i think that there's a space for everybody especially for the people who are just getting into it yeah like right now i'm just in the realm of productivity focus concentration healing addictions that's really good and sleep like i think i think all those things are really really great and then yeah if you really want to get into it you could do the past yeah. life regressions and yeah. all that stuff it's it you know that's the thing when I, when I tell people when it comes to like hypnosis I, I I say there's two types of people there there are the Newtonian physics people right yep. who come from the belief that okay in order to make a change or in order to do something I have to physically interact with an object and you know it moves around physically I have to physically do something to get a result and then there's what I call the you know the, the quantum physics you know people or the law of attraction people who come from the the space of energy that it's like okay if I'm thinking this I'm feeling this then that energy goes out there and then it can influence the reality you know around me so it's not physically doing something it's creating an energetic state that manifests something so and whatever uh, space somebody is in, you know, they're going to find results, you know, relative to, you know, to hypnosis. But I think when you do look at it from that perspective of, you know, the energy of, you know, of, of life going out there and life is a reflection of what we, you know, manifest within, I think there's a lot of um, opportunity for, for people there. I think there's a lot of, and I, you know, you, I hear from people, you know, that say, Hey, these things happen. I've had experiences like that, where I'm coming, when I realized when I changed my mental state, when I changed my, you know, emotional state, one of the things that I, that I share with people is, you know, circumstances don't matter, only your state of being matters. So when you come from that centered space, it's amazing to see how the world around you reflects you know, back that, that peace and that harmony and that uh, calmness within and, outside of ourselves. And one of the greatest lessons that I got from hypnosis, I'll add that to the three. So I became less negative. I moved towards peace. Life was more flexible and I became more intentional in my life. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't being controlled by the outside forces. I had a center grounding. I have something that I know to be true and I know to be me is that I am a human and I am not influenced by these outside forces. I am in control of my actions and I'm in control of my life. And you have no idea how powerful that is. Like, it's no, incredible. I, actually, I, you know, I do, because, <laughs> you know. I, I, you know, and I think that that is, I mean, that's getting into some, you know, we can get into some ethereal, you know, stuff out there, but I, I think civilization and, and, and humanity at one point understood that they understood the nature of um, conscious energy yeah. and, 
at like it's like I said, you know, we we got away from that and almost like we we forgot about that. And uh, I think we're coming back into that. I actually say I should feel we're coming back into that, not necessarily mm. think, but we're we're people are waking up and realizing that there is this conscious creation called physical reality that you know you can interact with on your own terms and that you can actually create and you can you can do more than just you know being someplace or being somewhere or being in existence but you're actually creating and you're and you're thriving and you can you know do those things that you prefer with life you know you're able to allow life or make life happen as opposed to just you know life determining what's you know going to happen to you okay Screw it. You pulled my arm here. We'll spend 10 minutes and we'll go into this mystical realm. We'll go into this ethereal realm because I think that it's it's really, really, really important. And um, and God, like there's so much to talk about here. But w- one thing I do want to do is keep it a little bit grounded because, you know, it's this. Th- these are crazy, crazy concepts. But the the, re- the way I really want to start is thinking about something like Native Americans, thinking about the the people of the past. And one of the stories that you see is something like religion, something like um, these beliefs in energy and all of these things. And when you have these beliefs, the first thing that you must realize and something like the sun goes to war with, uh, with the demons at the night and then it rises every morning and wins, right? Like all of these, all of these beliefs, they're completely illogical. They're completely irrational, right? And they're not true in the sense that we think of true. They're not real in the sense that we think of real, scientifically real, but at the same time, they're real, right? Like in the question of whether or not Jesus rose from the dead, for some people, they say Jesus had to actually rise from the dead. Or some people say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because he did rise from the dead, not in the way that we are like in the physical way, but he actually did rise from the dead. And Well, those are two completely different worlds. And when you think about our scientific mindset, the mindset that we have today, it's completely scientific real. We have to worry, we have to wonder whether or not it's actually true. And the problem with that is that's conscious, right? That is the conscious mind. But then you you disregard the subconscious mind. Jesus, the idea of Jesus, the idea of, of religion, the idea of spirituality and energy and all these things, they say, screw it. Why do I have to care about this conscious mind? Why do I have to care about it? All I care about is influencing the subconscious mind, which is going to influence my actions, which is going to make myself a better person, which is what religion does, even though, well, which it's supposed to do, even though it makes no logical sense. And I think that's a great place to start. I'll let you go. Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I was raised um, Mormon, right? Mm-hmm. I, I live in I live in Utah. I'm no longer uh, practicing, uh, you know, Mormon, but and it actually grew up in New Jersey. Uh, where are you from? So I grew up in southern New Jersey. Uh, I'm from Mormon. an Alpin. Yep. You're from Camden, correct? Uh, well, the, in Deptford. So outside of, you know, Philadelphia, yep. just outside of the Walt Whitman Bridge. But and so I, and I think if you look at all of these concepts of, you know, religion. And then you look at some of these concepts of, you know, spirituality or some of the the new age concepts, there's these interesting connections. You know, when you talk about, okay, if you have the faith of a, a mustard seed, right, you can, you can move mountains, you can do these things if you have, you know, faith. And it's like, okay, well, you know, people talk about like the law of attraction, right? If you, you feel something, you know, that, that can, you know, that can, uh, you can manifest that you can make that happen. And I remember um, my ex-father-in-law, I think this was like 15 years ago or something. um, uh, And he hit my uh, in-laws were, you know, they were very staunch Mormon and uh, I was at the time, but it was interesting. I I found an old book around some stuff that my, my, my mother-in-law had, and it was, It was this book from the 60s that was talking about the law of attraction before the law of attraction was even kind of a thing that we talk about now. They didn't even use the law of attraction. It was just all about, you know, thinking these things and, you know, believing something. And then people got, you know, the results, both for the negative and for for the positive. And I I define, define the law of attraction basically what your the energy that you're putting out there right your your vibra- vibrational energy which is a result of your emotional energy goes out and kind of it's it's like a, a you know a beacon it sends that energy out and then of course it attracts like energy back 
Yeah, and, so positive, positive attracts positive, negative attracts negative. Right. And, you know, and, and I tell the story about, you know, my dad, I, I have one sister that when we, when we were kids, my father would say there could be a million people on the beach and the seagulls would crap on your sister's head. And, <laughs> and my, my sister laughs about it, but like, she's got this mindset where all this negative stuff happens and she, you know, she feels negative. She thinks negative, she worries negative. So therefore all these, you know, negative things, you know, wind up showing up and mm. versus, um, you know, people that think uh, positive. Right. And, and Joe Dispenza has got a great book called you are the placebo. And he details um, uh, these studies of people, these experiences with people who literally uh, thought themselves and felt themselves back into healing their body. And conversely, people who were thinking they were unhealthy people who were feeling unhealthy. And then they wound up, you know, manifesting unhealthy or, you know, not lack of health in their body disease and, and whatnot. So I, you know, I picked up this, I'm looking at this book that my, you know, my mother-in-law had had on a bookshelf or someplace. And it was so funny because my father goes, why do we have that book? Get rid of that garbage, throw yeah. it out. It's ridiculous. I'm like, let me get this straight. You think and feel you can get down on your knees and then you can, you can say this prayer to this, you know, invisible entity. And those prayers would be answered. Somebody in this book says, I'm thinking these thoughts or feeling these thoughts, prayers, if you will, yeah. and it can be answered, right? It was the same philosophy, but through, you know, a different prism. And we all write ourselves permission slips, right? About what we're going to accept and what we're going to believe. But all these concepts relative to, you know, you look at studies across, you know, religion, you look at spiritual studies and, and new age, there's, there's all these bits and pieces that are connected. It's like, they all have this foundation of what I think ancient humanity and ancient ancestors were aware of, but then just kind of broke off and then wound up creating their own interpretations and their own versions of things. And then of course, things get, you know, things get watered down. So I'm definitely going to give a modern example of this. Um, George Lucas. George Lucas is the creator of Star Wars. He had a great quote, which really, really blew me away. He says, I don't want my movies to replace religion. Yeah. Because, yeah. because there's this sort of religious fanaticism that comes from watching yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, we don't even have to describe it. We just know that there is. And people go crazy for it. And it's almost as if people are adopting Star Wars as their new religion. Yeah. And, well, first of all, I'm going to say to George Lucas, you can't. You can't. <laughs> You can't have that not happen because it just happens. Like people feel that way and they're gravitating towards it. And we could even say that Star Wars or movies or mythology or the Avengers or Marvel or DC comets or whatever, all of these are the new religion. And what they do is they bypass the conscious mind. You don't care about whether or not Tony Stark actually defeated Thanos or whether Darth Vader actually exists. All you care about is, well, that bypasses the conscious mind, and all you care about is the lessons that you learn from there, the stories, all of these amazing things that come from it. And then you, maybe without realizing it, but also while realizing it, you get inspired by these stories. After I watch a superhero movie, I'm like, wow, maybe I should start doing something with my life, you know? Yeah. And, and that's oh, it. I, I was just, I can't, there was a German scientist in the 1600s, and I can't, I was reading this, article, I can't think of his name, but he was at the time considered to be one of the most brilliant um, scientific minds. Um, but he had these ideas, these crazy ideas that maybe the earth revolved around the sun, right. And not the other <laughs> way around. And, but he knew that he couldn't just write and tell people this. So he wound up creating what was kind of considered the first science fiction story, right? He had written this uh, story about somebody that had traveled to the moon and there were moon people there. And then and who's able to um, describe his scientific beliefs and his philosophy was um, that you can't just tell people this, but if you put it in the context of, you know, a, maybe a story that they're going to be more easily able to believe um, that will help, you know, teach them. The, the interesting thing is once the, he had only written one copy of it, right. Because they didn't, you know, the printing press and stuff like that. And there was one um, yeah. 
written one copy and then people from his hometown to began to put two and two together and they wound up bringing his mother uh, on trial for being a witch. It was kind of, <laughs> of course, her. I can't, I don't, I can't think of it all, but you can, yeah, maybe it was Copernicus. It was potentially. No, it wasn't. Uh, if I, and I saved this, the, the thing that I was reading about, I'm not going to go through my phone and try to find the, uh, the bookmark okay. now. But, but yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's what it was, was that it was this, um, he had an idea to teach people, to influence people. And he put it in the context of, you know, of a, of a story. And, but, and the thing too, is one of the things that I always, my wife taught me this, right. When we say there's no right where there's wrong way, there's only one, oh, if it works for you or not. But one of the things that a common theme that I would put within my programs is to allow people to realize that they can eliminate neediness, right? Because so many times we say, you know, if this person did this, then I could feel great. If this person thought that way, if this person acted this way, then all of a sudden I'm going to be okay. We create these um, requirements, right? We need this to happen. We need this person to be this way. We need this person to do this. We need this person to believe like us and see from our perspective. Yeah. But when you let go of that and you can just allow and realize that, you know, everybody's on their own journey and you can allow everybody their own experience so we don't have to constantly, you know, we're not trying to force people, uh, you know, a view or a particular, uh, you know, way of of life. And and that's well, that's sort of the idea, right? The idea is that Christian Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, whatever. I probably said that wrong. I think I did. But no matter what, they're all creations of the mind, and they're all tapping into the same part of the mind, right? This spirituality. And you could even say Star Wars does the same thing because I think it does. And well, why would you discriminate? Yes. Why would you discriminate based off of what someone's opinion or what, or their religion? It's all, it's all the same thing. And we don't really realize that. And if there's, you know, and, and the thing is what somebody calls God, right. Or somebody else refers to a source energy. If we're, if we're tapping into that, from the frame of reference of, you know, true love and compassion and kindness, um, then we're all, we're all going to be better off, you know, that way. Okay. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, support your other point, which I think was really, really incredible, which was this idea that um, our consciousness, right? This actually, so you actually, in one of your other podcasts, you talked about the conscious mind as the bouncer to a club yeah. and, and the, the, the critical faculty. The critical faculty. Yes. Right. And in neuroscience, we talk about this as the prefrontal cortex. And then the subconscious mind is where the party's at. You know, that's where, that's where things are actually happening, you know? And it, I, I find that really, really incredible because when you really like to think about it, you imagine that, and this is true neuroscientifically, basically your emotional brain is the thing that creates emotions and things. And the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that inhibits. So it says, okay, you feel this emotion, inhibit. I don't like it, right? I'm going to kick this, this thought, this feeling out of the bar, out of the club, and I don't want to deal with it. The thing that stories, religion, energy, all of these things do is they bypass. They bypass that guard. They bypass the conscious mind. They bypass this critical faculty. And it's because we've let our guard down. And it's really, really interesting. You talk about science fiction, and it really, really blows my mind because we think about it. And ever since the 1600s, because th that's probably a good place to start, or probably even further, the goal of society, the goal of what we are trying to do here is to increase our critical faculty increase our rationality, increase our logic, increase the size of our prefrontal cortex. And what are we trying to do there for? We're trying to inhibit. We're trying to get a stronger bouncer, a stronger, we'll say, yeah, a stronger bouncer so that these radical ideas, these flexible ideas don't get into the club. And it's, it blows my freaking mind because you look at the impact of, of what what happens there is that, well, first of all, science fiction, right? Mythology, those things are becoming ever more popular. Avengers is 
literally blowing the world apart because of the impact that it's having on people. Harry Potter, all of these stories are really changing people's lives. And then at the same time, we're seeing more intolerance, more people who are repressive and anxious and depressed. And what is the reason for that? Probably because they're not accepting things into their subconscious mind. They're not open to opportunity. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the one thing it's, if, when you know that you can be in control of what's going in there and then you take um, intention and purpose to determine what's going to go into your subconscious mind, rather than just what goes in there from what you're seeing and, you know, reading and that sort of thing. That's where the big difference happens, where instead of allowing somebody else to hypnotize you and somebody else to put in their suggestions, you learn to do that for, you know, yourself and, and create yourself as you prefer to be. You know, I mean, I the, what's the statistic is, you know, it's like, I think Americans are, Americans alone that I read is like they check their smartphones 3 billion times a day, you know, 50 per person. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, then of course the, the old stats were, you know, you go through hypnosis like 12 to 20 times a day. Right. Well, that was, you know, that was before smartphones and, and everything that we have now. So literally when, and I've said literally a lot, I'm going to hypnotize myself to not use that word. Um, <laughs> but when we look at our, when we look at our phones, we are experiencing a hypnotic state. We're so focused on that. And if we're experiencing that hypnotic state, we're focused on that. Then all of a sudden that information that's coming out of there is the stuff that's going to go into us. And what is the answer? And this is a perfect place to end it. The answer is to be mindful, be intentional, calm your mind down and really realize that the world is a lot more flexible than your rigid structure. If you have a rigid structure and I highly highly suggest that to start a great place to start is to watch one of the be one of the million people that have watched john moyer's hypnosis sessions johnmoyer.com is where you can find all of his links and literally just go on youtube search john moyer and there is so much so much stuff there so keep going keep, keep going you have more stuff going on so tell me well that's you know that's what that's what i'm enjoying doing i'm just i'm just diving into right now just focus. You know, I haven't done a show since, you know, the beginning of last year and I don't miss performing, right? I like, I like being able to take my time and and just, you know, create the content. So um, yeah, so I'm focused hundred percent on my, on my YouTube channel. I've uh, kind of inked a a deal to do a few programs for Relax Melodies. That's a, a, that's another big app. Um, So there's going to be a couple of my, uh, my content or my, my hypnosis, sleep hypnosis are going to be on, uh, on that app. Um, And that's, you know, that's what it's all about for me. It's just, you know, being able to put that out there, you know, to the world for people so they can, yeah, just look up John Moyer on, uh, on YouTube and I'm right there and accessible. And and he has literally changed millions of lives. Yeah. Why would you even do a stage hypnosis anymore? Like you could just influence millions of people with a YouTube video. It's incredible. It's absolutely. I don't have to leave my house. It works out well. I don't have to put on a suit and tie and go do a show. I like it. Exactly. Exactly. John Moyer. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Nick Lugo Show with John Moyer. To support this podcast, please give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or subscribe to my YouTube channel. These things do more than you know. And finally, well, I'm going to leave you off with a quote from Derek Sivers from Tim Ferriss' book, Tools of Titans. If more information was the answer, then we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. Remember that action is the thing that you should be taking. And well, that is the difference between those who succeed and those who don't. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you next time.